Once upon a time, there was a man who suffered from pretty severe anxiety disorder. And he was a mess. He, he also was starting to have heart palpitations. And his wife finally said, we need to get you to the doctor. So she takes him, she drives him to the doc, and he goes through an entire workup. And uh, it took a long morning, it took half the morning. And just as they were getting ready to leave, the doc says to the wife, could you come here a second, please? And he, she steps back into his office and he closes the door and says, your husband is really ill. He, he might die. He, he needs, there need to be changes in his life. First of all, I need you to really work on his diet. I need three really good, healthy food, fresh food meals each day. I need you to try to create a stress-free home environment. So don't bring all kinds of upsetting, stressful news. Do not nag him. And uh, I also strongly recommend that no less than three times a week there is some serious cuddling and romance. <laughs> so she goes back out and she and her husband are walking out to the car. And her husband says to her, well, what did he say? She said, the doctor said you're going to die. <laughs> well, we're all carrying around some degree of stress. But one, every one and every five of you, within the sound of my voice and throughout the rest of our country, is overwhelmed with worry. And I want to talk about it with you. Where do you go when you feel that anxiety? Anxiety is basically a bunch of good things that have morphed into something ugly. Is it good to reflect on the past? Absolutely. But if you reflect on the past and second-guess yourself over and over and over for things you said wrong or might have said wrong or things you fear somebody thought were wrong, and all you do is worry, worry, worry about what people think about you, you will never be able to enjoy being with people and you'll start to become a hermit where you think, it's all on me, I've got to fix this. And so you run around trying to take control over every little feature of your life and make it all perfect. And you beat on yourself when it isn't perfect and you also drive everybody around you totally crazy because they can never please you. It's never, nothing's ever good enough of what they do because nothing's ever good enough of what you do. And the worst of it all is that you fear that God's throne is empty, that his angels have gone to play in another universe, and that you're all alone facing your demons and facing the demon. I'd like to invite you to take your Bible and open it up today or a mobile device if you like doing it that way and open it up to 1 Peter chapter 5 for some magnificent words, two little paragraphs that will change your life. They will change the way you think. Two times in these two paragraphs, the word suffer and suffering is used. That's actually the theme of First Peter. Five magnificent chapters. They're an amazing balance of doctrinal instruction and practical Christian living. Usually when I invite you to read the Bible, I'm always bugging you to read it slower than you usually do. To read it at super slow speed, like at three miles an hour, just really slow, and savor it and think about it. Read a sentence and stop and reflect. Read another sentence and stop because usually it's so full of stuff in there, you need to absorb it. If you go too fast, you'll, you'll skip stuff. You'll miss treasures that God put in there. But once in a while, it's good to read in volume. And if you ever decide, just for the experience, to read First Peter, all five chapters, just read them straight through. Have a little pad next to the Bible and make hash marks every time you see the word suffer or suffering or hardship. And there probably are two dozen just in these five little chapters. The people who was writing to, in their hardships, had begun to suspect that maybe their faith was a fraud. You know, it messes with you after a while. Because the theory is that when you become a Christian, your life gets better in every way. Every day and every way, 
our life in Christ gets better and better and better. Doesn't that sound like thoughts you've had or old sermons that you've heard or things you've learned in Sunday school or heard from a Christian parent or grandparent? There's grand theory behind all of these things, but sometimes that just makes you an even juicier, more appealing target for the devil. And the bitter irony is that sometimes the closer you get to Jesus, the harder your walk in the Lord will get. I always think of Frodo dragging the ring. Um, The ring was a lot of fun to have at the beginning of Frodo's little journey, wasn't it? But every page you turned and every book as you get into the trilogy, the ring becomes a heavier and heavier burden as he gets closer to Mount Doom. The reason that that makes such sense is it's based on the rhythms of the Christian life, that sometimes our life gets harder when you think it ought to be getting easier. But the conclusion to draw is not God loves you any less or he's left the room or he's punishing you or doesn't care if the storms of life are breaking over your head and wrecking your finances or breaking up your family. It is not any of those things. In fact, he said, the hardships you are experiencing only identify you with the sufferings of Christ. Not because you are helping Jesus die for the sins of the world. That he managed to do all by himself. But here is what it does mean that you are simply walking on the path that he walked on. And when your life gets hard and you take some painful reverses, that just means you're right where God anticipated you would be. And now the experience and interaction is pay attention to see how God helps you in the middle of these hardships. And here's what Peter has to say. These are grand words. By now you should have found chapter 5. Go to verse 6 with me. When you are stressed, he says, here's my advice, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. I love that phrase, in due time. It it is an almost untranslatable Greek word that means God's absolutely right time, like the magic time when something's going to change when God's plan of salvation for the world and for you personally is going to take a major step forward. And there are times when that is not going to happen, and then there are the golden moments, the teachable moments, the aha moments, when God is going to move the needle in a significant way. And your job is to wait patiently for those aha times, and God will lift you up when you have fallen. And you can be just totally serene about that. You don't have to fret over past mistakes you've made and endlessly beat yourself up for things in your past. Let it go. The Son of God went to the cross so that you could let go of the garbage in your past and so that you could start liking yourself again and so that you could start liking other people again. And the Son of God went to the cross in order that you could always count on God's unconditional love. And he gets so much done by allowing you to be stressed as Christ was stressed. But then when he sends a rescue, realize that that energy, that love, that strength came from heaven. Don't just say, well, I prayed to God and nothing happened. Thank God for my friend. She helped me get through it. Who do you think sent you the friend? But you don't have to put this all on yourself. Humble yourself and just wait for his time. He will lift you up. Second, cast all your anxiety on him. That word cast is not even quite strong enough. The Greek word means to just pick it up and fling it, not just kind of walk it over like you got a bag of garbage you're taking out to the garbage cart and you kind of gingerly kind of drop it in. Just grab it up, put it in a sack, and just throw it onto the dump and get rid of it. Let go of it. In fact, fling it and throw it at Jesus. His shoulders are big enough to handle it, and he invites you to do that. You aren't boring him when you talk to him about your troubles. You're not disappointing him that he thinks you're too weak. Why haven't you fixed this yourself? He understands, for he himself went through terrible hardships, partly so that he would not only know in his head, but that he would know from experience what it is like for you to be squeezed and stressed and how to deal with stuff in your life without becoming anxiety-laden. 
He went through this for you. So cast it on him because he cares for you. Your well-being is important to him. Be self-controlled. Don't let other people provide your narrative or theme song for you. Let God's opinion of you be how you think about your life. Don't let anybody else put the tag loser on you. You and I are winners because we're connected to Christ. You and I are sons and daughters of the Most High God. We're, we're heirs of heaven. We're bulletproof. We're immortal. We are timeless and deathless. Our future has already been guaranteed and those chapters of our lives are locked in and set for us. Only the tweener chapters are part of life's adventure. And all the stuff you're sweating and grieving over right now are only going to make for really interesting stories when we're sitting around on God's patio and we are swapping stories. We'll be able to share how he rescued us from all these problems and how you were God's instruments of helping another tormented, anxious sinner process the grief and struggles that she or he may be working on. Be self-controlled and alert if you say, Lord, help me, I'm, I'm drowning right now, and he sends somebody, don't look at that person and say, beat it, I've talked to the Lord and I'm waiting for the Lord's rescue. She might be the Lord's rescue. God always prefers to work subtly and indirectly. You can argue with him about why he didn't do more obvious flagrant miracles when you get to heaven. Argue if you like. But I'm telling you, I've lived long enough now to see his MO is he prefers, first of all, to see you exercise your own gifts and talents he's placed within you. He wants to bring out of you and hardship brings out of you what you got. You might have underestimated your own stamina and toughness. In fact, stamina and toughness do not come from donuts, do they? Or, or uh, barca loungers. They come from working out. That's where a strong body comes from. A strong faith does not get strong by having everything given to you on a platter. Sometimes you got to sweat. Sometimes you need to be on your knees. But God will lift you up, anxious people. He will lift you up. Be alert. Why? Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now, here's, this is a wonderful metaphor, but the problem with metaphors is that it's hard to translate it into your life because you can imagine a fierce animal like somehow what if a bunch of your friends as a joke picked you up and threw you over the fence at the zoo into the pen or cage of some ferocious animal like a lion or a tiger who knows how long you'd last but the devil is a lion coming after you but I have never yet met a person who's been physically dismembered by a, an actual devil in lion form. I mean, that, that's not the threat to you. The threat to you is that Satan is going to bite a piece out of your heart, out of your feelings and emotion. He's going to try to get you to hate on yourself. He's going to try to get you to be suspicious of your friends and think, I don't really have any friends. They're all lying to me and they're all going to leave me and betray me sooner or later. I can't trust a one of them. He's going to try to mess with your family and disrupt the trust and loyalty that you have had. And if you can't even trust your family, who can you trust? He's going to fan into flame every painful memory you have from your youth and make that into like a hot mess in your head that you can never get over and can't get past. You can't let it go. Satan will try to remind you of it over and over. That's what ferocious demonic lions do. They torment you into being anxious over things over which you have no control. Be alert. Don't let him do that. You can let go of the stuff in your life. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith, your Lord Jesus said, you're valuable to me. Don't let Satan's trash talk get into your center of consciousness. Jesus says, you're valuable to me. You're precious enough that I would be willing to die for you. You are indeed a bad enough sinner that blood had to be shed, but you're so valuable to me, I chose to make it my blood instead of yours. You're so valuable to me, I did what you could not do, and now it's a gift. And Satan says, no, there's no such thing as gifts. That's too good to be true. You've got to work for it. 
you got to be a perfectionist and clean yourself up. And then, of course, because nobody can do that, then you start getting depressed and hating yourself because you know you're not perfect. And Satan says, see, I told you, loser. And Jesus says, I did. I did that. I've washed you clean. Now come and, come and live in the land of joy. Let some sunshine be on you. I'm going to help you. Let's do this together. We're going to walk through this together. Relax. Let go. Put it in my hands. Let me lead for a while. If the way you were doing things was bringing you that much stress, let me lead for a while. Just ride along with me and pay attention to what I'm sending you. Stand firm in the faith. You're not alone. That's another trick of the lion, uh, Satan, looking for people to devour, is to make you think you're alone. You're the only one that you're getting cheated because everybody else has it together except you. Not true. Your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. This is just part of life on this earth. It's even part of the Christian experience to live like Christ. And, the, and Peter's point is, and that's okay. You can like your life even with its stresses. The God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory. He went looking for you and wants you to be in his eternal family. He called you to eternal glory after you had suffered, how long? A little while. Tell this to your friends who are struggling. Hang on, sister, a little. This is just a little. Eternity is long. This is just a little blip in time. Hang on, you can get through this. You can't always avoid every stress. Some things you just have to go through, but it's only for a little while. He's himself, now here are four fabulous promises. Will himself restore you? He's going to put your life and you back together, partly on this earth, completely in heaven. Second, he's going to make you strong. When you feel weak and out of control, Ask the Lord for strength and then drop your messes on him, cast them on him, and wait for his strength. He will send it. Third, he will make you firm. You, will, you may feel wobbly like you can't hardly even stand up straight. God will firm up your wobbly backbone and enable you to get back on your feet. And steadfast, that word comes from... Uh, a Greek word meaning a foundation. You might feel like you're standing on quicksand, that everything around you is so shaky. You might feel like you're in an earthquake. Everything's cracking and crumbling around you. God will simply rebuild a new foundation, and you may rest easy. Uh, scripture calls that a rock. You may stand, or when you have to sit, or when you're really down, lie on that rock, but that will hold you. It will hold you up, and you don't have to try to do this by yourself. So God will do this in a variety of different ways. He may choose to answer your prayer, Lord, help me. I'm coming to you with my anxieties. He wants you to throw your messes right onto him. Just let it go and walk away. It's totally okay. He can take it. He's glad for the messes. Secondly, he may just choose to fix it unilaterally. God is doing miracles. We don't know how and when. His right time may or may not be our right time. And that may be what he does. And we've got some incredible stories of things that turned around in people's lives for which they could find no cause or effect, except God just did it. But as I mentioned earlier, he may just send some people into your life. Pay attention and see what they bring. Listen to the advice that they bring. Listen to their counsel. Trust people. There's goodness in people. They're sinful fools too, just like you. But God gets his messages from people of kind hearts who can see what's happening in your life. And sometimes they tell you stuff that you need to know. They might come up to me and say, Brother, you're stressed out and I think, I think it's your diet. you got to lay off the Cheetos, man, and those greasy chips are doing nothing for you. Uh, you have not earned the right to eat potato chips right now. i got a tape measure here that says you, you need to let them go. They're not good for you. It's messing with your digestion and you're not sleeping well. Uh, somebody might come to me and say, you drink way too much coffee. No wonder you look tired all the time. 
that coffee is only a prop concealing the fact that you've got deep fatigue and you are not rested. You're hurting yourself. That, remember, your body's the temple of the Spirit. But sometimes we can't see this in ourselves. Your friends, your family, your physician, the medical people in your life will tell you things and they act as God's agents helping you with things you need to know to help you better manage the stress in your life. Don't fight that influence. Listen and let God help you in that way. There are all kinds of healthy things you and I can do. Many of us are sunlight um, affected, like we need sunlight. Sunlight creates vitamins in your body in God's amazing way. And some people just need a whole lot more than others. Let the sun on your face and on your skin. Find a way. And even in the darkest days of winter, they get a sun lamp in it and, uh, and hang out underneath it. There are a lot of healthy things you can do just to get your life to be better. Seriously, look at exercise. People who have just a like a 15-minute walk a day, people who walk or run a little bit every day are way healthier, more cheerful, and less anxious than people who don't. Let God answer your prayers and use the wisdom that he has given you and let him do for you. Put, bundle this all together and God is going to be engaged in our lives to make them better and be of help to all of us who struggle with anxiety and use us to be useful to our friends and loved ones who struggle with anxiety, to be encouraged. Cast all your cares on him. So one last little so what moment today to, to kind of finish things off. Most of you are dragging something around, that some unfinished messy business that you can't let go of, that is driving you nuts, it is defeating or depressing you, it is frustrating you, it's hurting you. Don't go home with it today. We're going to have the, God's angels come in and take out the trash after this service. And I want you to dump them here. Leave your garbage here. Leave it here. And somebody else will clean it up. God will take care of it. But today, cast your anxieties on him and relax. Why? Because he cares for you.